Hello all, Rick here with a video on the capabilities and mission profile of the Lunar Class Starship. The origin of the design was created by Sean Tuanju for a competition to create the USS Titan to appear in the books following Captain Riker and his crew. The winning design was featured on the cover of the fourth book of the series, The Sword of Damocles, and became the Lunar Class moving forwards. The Lunar was only canonised, however, with its appearance in Lower Decks and then as part of the fleet that intercepted a Borg incursion in 2401, but it is a great addition to the lore proper and another of my favourite vessels. The Lunar class was designed to hold true to the earliest values of Starfleet, those of exploration and scientific discovery. Its earliest designs were penned in 2369 by the Ephrosian scientist Dr. Zin Ra Havrai, when word of the discovery of the Bajoran wormhole swept through the Federation. In the early days before the Dominion War, Starfleet was eager to capitalise on this new access to a far-flung corner of the Milky Way. The Lunar class was designed to be a vessel capable of mapping those uncharted waters, but it would not enter service for another decade due to the circumstances around the Gamma Quadrant and the aforementioned war. The first of the line, the USS Luna NX-80101, was developed over the next three years, and in 2372 the prototype was deployed for testing from Utopia Planitia. However, there was an accident in engineering which resulted in several deaths, and it served as evidence that the designs needed some more refinement. However, off of the Borg and Dominion threats, Starfleet shifted its design ethos from scientific vessels such as the Oberth and refits of older designs like the Excelsior. Instead, they began to focus on the development of defensive ships and bolstering their lines. This shelved the development of the Lunar class for the time being, and with the prototype Lunar still in no fit state to enter active service, the class of ship would not be picked up again until several years after the war's conclusion. In 2375, the Dominion War ended and Starfleet vowed to return to a more peaceful stance, including resuming missions centred on exploration and replacing its lost vessels with newer ones to fulfil its mandate. One of these projects was the Lunar Class once again and development and prototyping resumed. Forts were ironed out and the first wave of 12 new Lunar Class vessels were ready to be launched in 2379 fresh off the line. The naming convention was to have them all named after the moons of the Sol system, and, as mentioned, it was originally designed from the ground up to be a long-term deep space exploration vessel of the Gamma Quadrant, and all the systems that that would require. It had state-of-the-art sensor systems, and a double refracting warp core matrix with twin intermixed chambers. This gave it a cruising speed of warp 8 a factor higher than the Galaxy class, and a maximum warp of 9.975, putting it alongside the Sovereign. It was not unheard of for Lunar class vessels to be deployed on missions up to 30,000 light years away from the core of the Federation. It was 450 metres long, could operate without theoretical resupply for two years, and refits for four. Its full life expectancy was counted in decades, providing technology allowed for upgrades to keep the class up to spec. Additionally, it had a mission pod like the Akira or Nebula class that could be swapped out for different roles. The primary three seemed to be an extra few science labs, a tactical pod replete with more weapons platforms, or an advanced long-range sensor system. The last one seems to be the most apt for the Lunar's usual mission profile. This is not to say that the ship was not unarmed. Starfleet had learned a harsh lesson from its recent wars, and although it can strip back the armaments of its vessels, especially those termed science ships, the Lunar class still packed a punch. It had up to nine Type 10 and later Type 13 phaser emitters, and both quantum and photon capabilities, with two fore and one aft launcher, 
On top of this, its experimental warp core design gave it loads of power to play with, and very sturdy shielding. Additionally, it had the recessed bridge design, like the Akira, and a lower profile with the darker colour of its hull. It's not confirmed in canon, but it does look like that it was clad in ablative armour too, based purely on its looks. It had a crew capacity of 350, and broke with the majority of Starfleet vessels with a new design experiment. For generations, Starfleet seemingly operated vessels with predominantly human crews, although this was not the actual case, even though there was a proportionally large number of humans in Starfleet. We only see this for the obvious IRL ease of production, but also because the vessels on which Star Trek takes place are simply those with more human crews. Ships like the Constitution Intrepid in 2268 and the Tecumbra in 2375 were all Vulcan crews. While this may seem a strange notion for Starfleet, there are several practical reasons behind such crew dispersal. The chief ones being shared cultural expectations and life support preferences. An all Andorian crew, for example, could have life support permanently set a few degrees lower than a comfortable human temperature, or an all Benzite crew could have their own atmospheric composition instead of wearing breathers. The Lunar class was built to be able to accommodate all sorts of different life support requirements in one vessel. The corridors featured an adaptive gravity that could locally adjust for individuals as they passed by based on their homeworld, and most impressively, several sections of the vessel were host to reinforced tunnels that ran parallel to the corridors and were filled with water for aquatic species to navigate the greater area of the vessel. This allowed a species, such as the Zindi Aquatics, to serve aboard it alongside the sentient cetaceans that originally had been confined to a small area near the fore of the vessel. In fact, the crews were so diverse that it was a point of pride for the USS Titan that only 15% of its roster are human. Overall, the Lunar class was indeed a science ship. It had the facilities it needed to reach those unexplored deep space areas and perform long-term missions out there before returning to known space. However, even Starfleet science ships are now seemingly armed to the teeth, or at least capable of taking a pounding with the capability to be outfitted with even heavier armaments. The Dominion War changed the face of the Federation, and if the Lunar class was the fulfilment of their promise to get back to exploration and science, then perhaps Starfleet was changed far more than it thinks. It is not a sovereign class, but it was considered a capital ship, one bolstered by newer technologies, and occasionally sent out on defensive duties. The USS Titan took on both these deep space exploration missions and local defence duties, as did other Lunar class ships. But I guess when you are heading into the unknown, it pays to be prepared for anything. Thank you for watching this breakdown on the Lunar class, and what do you think? As I said in the introduction, alongside the Akira and Excelsior, the Lunar is one of my favourite designs of Starship, even if it does seem to have a bit of an identity crisis at times. Thanks again for watching. I've been Rick, and goodbye.